the Gilda's maximum lawyers community of legal entrepreneurs who are taking their businesses and lives to the next level. As a Guild member, you'll build relationships, be held accountable, and learn strategies specifically designed to get you unstuck and accelerate your plan for growth. Members are also granted exclusive access to masterminds hosted around the country. Our next event is coming up, and we're heading to Scottsdale, Arizona. There's something truly magical about the power of these in-person connections where real-time breakthroughs happen. Picture this. You're surrounded by like-minded law firm owners tackling your business and mindset challenges together. The energy is electric, the insights are transformative, and the results are game-changing. Investing in yourself is the best decision you'll ever make. The knowledge, strategies, and breakthroughs you'll gain are priceless assets that will supercharge your practice and propel you forward. Join the Guild and secure your ticket to Scottsdale at the best possible price by visiting maxlawevents.com. We as attorneys, we never dream of dropping a stack of judicial opinions on the desk of a clerk or, or a judge and say, Your Honor, these cases support the reason why we should win the case. Please read them. You'll see it, and I'm sure you'll agree with us. No. You write persuasive letters, persuasive briefs, other court filings to convince a judge to rule in your favor or to convince opposing counsel to do what you want them to do. Run your law firm the right way. The right way. This is... The Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Maximum Lawyer Podcast. Your hosts, Jim Hacking and Tyson Mutrix. Let's partner up and maximize your firm. Welcome to the show. You're back on the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mutrix. What's up? How you doing, Jim? Tyson, I'm really excited about our guest today. His name's Wayne Pollock. He was introduced to us by our friend, William Eady. His firm, Copo Strategies, is a limited scope boutique law firm with a niche practice. They help other attorneys and clients make those clients' cases in the court of public opinion. I think it's going to be a great show. Wayne, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks guys for having me. Hey, Jim. Hey, Tyson. And before I get started, let me just say I'm a big fan of of the podcast and I'm a subscriber. I think your episodes have a ton of useful information. I'm always scrambling at the end of each podcast to internalize what you guys have, have said and develop some action items for my business. So I'm excited to be here, and I, and I hope to give back through the content of my episode. Wayne, I really love the name Copo Strategies. Will you explain the, the meaning of Copo? Just tell what you do. Absolutely. So Copo Strategies, Copo stands for the Court of Public Opinion. As I said, it's a boutique, limited scope law firm with a niche practice. We provide legal strategy and services in the form of communications strategy and services. Working as a consultant to law firms or other lawyers, or as limited scope co-counsel to clients, me and my firm, we work with the media and other third parties to generate public interest in a particular legal dispute, or to help clients deal with public and media interest in the legal dispute that they do not generate. And uh, our services support the the favorable resolution of our clients' legal disputes while minimizing the reputational harm the disputes could cause. I launched my firm, uh, Copa Strategies, because I had saw a need uh, while I was at my big law, AmLaw 50 law firm for six and a half years after law school, I saw as a litigation associate a number of instances where either our firm opposing counsel or just outside in the real world, attorneys were ignoring the court of public opinion to the detriment of their clients. And I saw a need where I think client, and we'll get into this a bit later, but the clients want to have their stories told to the public, to the press. They want lawyers to tell their stories in courts of law, but they also many times want to tell their story more broadly. Look no further than the recent news coverage surrounding all the sexual harassment allegations against prominent men. You you have alleged victims or victims who want to tell their stories and they look to their attorneys to do so. And unfortunately, many attorneys still are in the mindset of declining to comment or simply saying, we'll vigorously defend this case or not even returning the reporter's phone calls. And that is detrimental to a a client. That's detrimental to the, the actual legal dispute. If you're able to turn up the pressure in the case, or other disputes against the other side, that's leverage. That's something that can help you resolve the case uh, more favorably. And just from a, from a branding perspective, I didn't want this to be the law offices of Wayne Pollock because I do a very niche area of the law, 
And in many instances, I am brought on as a consultant. I'm not even brought on as counsel. And I thought Copo Strategies was broad enough to cover what I do, strategies for engaging the court of public opinion. But in a way, it's also interesting. And it's not just the law office of or Pollock Law Group. It's something that, that oftentimes gets people talking and, and saying, huh, what does that even mean? So when I explain it, I usually get the, oh, man, that's, that's really interesting that you started this law firm to do that. Wayne, talk to us a little bit about your background in public relations and how working in public relations before you went to law school sort of infuses what you do today. I worked in public relations at, at a local Philadelphia area public relations and advertising firm for four years. And while I was there, I dealt with the media on a daily basis. And that gave me a sense of what the media looks at, uh, what they're interested in, how to communicate to the media. Now, that was 10, 11 years ago. And certainly the media has changed with the rise of social media, with more and more sophisticated online media and online content being served to news consumers. But having a PR background as a lawyer really gives me an edge in dealing with the press and dealing with with the legal issues at, that come up in a legal dispute because I'm able to translate. I'm able to help tell this oftentimes complex legal story in a way that is easily digestible by the media, that is framed in a way that lets the media understand why this is relevant to them, to their readers. And hopefully with that understanding of why it's relevant, they'll be more likely to uh, run a story or convey those thoughts or uh, issues to, to their readers. You know, we as attorneys, we never dream of dropping a stack of judicial opinions on the desk of a clerk or, or a judge and say, Your Honor, these cases support the reason why we should win the case. Please read them. You'll see. And I'm sure you'll agree with us. No. You write persuasive letters, persuasive briefs, other court filings to convince a judge to rule in your favor or to convince opposing counsel to do what you want them to do. It's the same thing with the media. A lot of attorneys think that they can just wait for a reporter to, to go on Pacer and find their case or that uh, once they even find that case, magically the reporter will know what to say, have a grasp of the legal issues and the facts at issue, and simply just you know write a story. That's not how it works. Attorneys need to be strategic and persuasive when they reach out to the media, when they reach out to other third parties who might be interested in joining forces with the, uh, with the lawyer based on the legal dispute at issue. And it needs to be some handholding. And again, the PR background helps me understand what reporters want and need. Uh, when you combine that with my understanding of the legal world, the legal disputes, with the process of litigation, oftentimes it's confusing. There's sometimes reporters get stuck on procedural issues. Like I had a reporter from a local business publication who was really interested in the standard for a motion to dismiss at the federal court level. Like he thought it was incredible that you could move to dismiss a case if um, you know there was no claim as a matter of law. And that was like a very small part of why I was talking to him. But thus, my ability to to translate the legal issues to a digestible level for a reporter and vice versa. Is, is helpful. So the, the, the PR background, I think, is, is, is really, for me, a key skill that separates what I do from other lawyers. And my legal background separates what I do from other PR people. Good luck with the PR person being able to translate and getting an instant knowledge of, like, for example, a motion to dismiss decision. Or good luck with the, or a PR person trying to advise a lawyer on what public statements could run afoul of ethical rules or could bump up against defamatory concerns. Uh, and certainly being able to be limited scope co-counsel and come in to preserve the attorney-client privilege, that's a big deal because most PR people cannot get attorney-client privilege even when they're hired by a law firm to do work concerning legal disputes. Wayne, one of our good buddies, Mitch Jackson, is big into newsjacking. He had some really big ones this week. Are there ways that we can get ahead of these stories sort of like, like Mitch does and shape the story in our favor? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So the newsjacking that Mitch does is more on the legal marketing side of talking to the media. And you guys had a really great podcast episode a while back. I think it was called Easy Publicity that also talked more about this type of legal marketing publicity. And that is related to what I do. But let me give you the newsjacking 
uh, which has been around for forever, by the way. It, it's cool to call it newsjacking, but it's been a fundamental public relations or marketing tool for forever, which is to say that you as an attorney can position yourself as an expert in particular areas of law when you are reaching out to reporters who you know are likely to cover a particular uh, story that, that comes into your area of law. So for example, if you're an employment discrimination attorney, you could track which reporters at your local papers are covering the Harvey Weinstein, Matt Lauer type of sexual harassment stories and hopefully reach out to them and say, hey, I'm Joe Blow. I'm an employment discrimination attorney in St. Louis, in San Francisco, wherever. And I'd be happy to chat with you about these types of cases as they come up. I've done X, Y, and Z. I've prosecuted, I've defended these types of cases, and I can help you with this. And, and building that relationship helps to get you hopefully more press for your practice and your particular area of the law that you can be perceived as an expert in. What I'm talking about is getting publicity and using publicity and public interest as a tool in your legal toolkit to help resolve your cases more favorably for your clients and also when applicable help protect their reputation against the damage that often happens when someone is named as a defendant in a legal dispute. But in terms of still getting ahead of the stories, there are things you could do. If you know that you are suing, so we'll, we'll put this in litigation framework right now because that's often where this comes about. It's certainly not the only area of the law where there is a court of public opinion engagement opportunity, but let's stick with, with basic litigation for right now. If you know you are suing a local university, well, find the local newspaper reporters or the online media reporters who cover universities as a beat. It's not too difficult to simply go onto those websites and just search for the names, perhaps the name of the defendant you're suing or even other schools or universities in the area, do a search, and see who is writing on them, writing on those stories. You might find that you have one reporter who covers the higher education beat or the local school system, and that's who you want to talk to. Are there trade publications out there, industry publications that cover a particular industry that tends to write about developments in that industry, including lawsuits? And here's a hint, if they have an online blog or an online media component, in addition to a monthly or weekly publication that, that comes in paper, they need content on a daily basis. And they might very well be interested to hear about the cases that you have concerning a company in that industry, for example, pharmaceutical or construction or technology. Likewise, if you are defending clients, you might want to look at who has covered your client before and who would make sense for you to reach out to and say, look, this lawsuit's been filed. There are some crazy allegations here. I wanna make it myself available to you either for an on the record interview or an on background interview. And I can make my client available too, to talk to you through, talk you through these allegations and why we don't think they have much merit. There is an offense and a defense to be played when you're talking about the, the court of public opinion. And oftentimes the best defense is a good offense and that would be going to reporters proactively and saying, look, here's what we're doing to uh, remedy this systematic problem that, that is reported on as a result of this legal dispute. So the newsjacking has a cousin when it comes to the, the court of public opinion, and that's proactive engagement, not waiting for reporters to find your case, but instead reaching out to them to say, look, we filed this particular case, you might be interested in it because X, Y, Z, or a case was filed against my client, and here is why we think it doesn't have merit. And let me get into it, if I may, just, just to add on before I forget. There's a defamation concern here. There is terrible case law across the country, notably in my home state of Pennsylvania. It's at the PA Supreme Court level. It's in New York. It's in New Jersey. It's, it's in a number of states. That says, as a matter of law, attorneys could be liable for defamation, again, as a matter of law, if they send copies of filings to reporters that contain defamatory allegations. In essence, in certain instances, attorneys lose the protection of the litigation privilege from defamation when they send their complaints to the media because the act of sending the complaint to the media neither arises naturally out of the proceeding or is relevant to what is going on in the proceeding. It's bad case law because I don't think it's true. I think what you're, when you talk to the press, you're very much related. It's related to what you're doing in the court of law. 
But nonetheless, there are bad cases that say attorneys could be liable for, uh, as a matter of, of law, for defamation. So the easy way around that is to simply tell the reporter the docket number. So when you're pitching the reporter, you say, you should know that this complaint was filed recently in the you know, Southern District of New York. The allegations are X, Y, and Z. The complaint alleges X, Y, Z. Here is the docket number. Let me know if you have any questions. And that, for the most part, should keep steer you clear as an attorney from the type of defamation concern when you're reaching out to the press. That's a great tip, Wayne. I have been known to send copies of complaints to reporters, so I will probably stop doing that and do just what you said. <laughs> news you can use. Yeah, exactly. So speaking of news you can use, my wife and I just got finished watching the Law & Order Menendez Brothers story on NBC. And, mm -hmm. you know, this was back pre-OJ even and pre, you know, CNN was a barely a startup. Mm -hmm. And Leslie Abramson was their lawyer. And that case was, without a doubt, fought in the court of public opinion from start to finish. I wonder, you know, what are the concerns? Because she was battling with the judge a lot. And a lot of the problems that she had in the court of public opinion stemmed from these rulings that she got from the judge. And what are sort of the rules for lawyers engaging in public discussion of cases while the cases are being tried? Sure. So, and let me just say that I think the, the area of criminal law is an immensely fertile ground for court of public opinion engagement. Unfortunately, most of the time, the prosecutors, whether it's state or federal, are running circles around the criminal defense attorneys, especially younger ones or older ones who don't, who don't really know how to use the media. And you see this in a number of instances. Most recently, I don't know if many of your listeners are following along, the, the Penn State frat hazing case where a 19-year-old sophomore at Penn State University died during an alleged frat hazing incident. And um, there's a criminal case against 20-something of the frat members. And the district attorney in, in the county where Penn State is located in Pennsylvania is a master of public relations. She's fantastic when it comes to PR. She was just on Megyn Kelly today about a week or two ago, after she had a press conference to announce new charges against some of the threat members. She was there, and basically for eight minutes during this interview, she was making her case for why these additional charges were both reasonable, why these charges should stick, and why these threat members were guilty. It was fascinating TV, but most people didn't even understand or know what was being told to them. So I'll give that in a second. But generally speaking, from an ethics perspective, most states follow the ABA model rule, rule 3.6, trial publicity, which says that attorneys cannot make statements that they know or reasonably should know will have a substantial likelihood of materially prejudicing an adjudicative proceeding. The, the U.S. Supreme Court defines that adjudicative proceeding as the trial, both the ability for a, a court for a judge to assemble jurors and the ability for jurors to determine a case on their own based on the facts entered into evidence and not facts that they learn about outside of the court through the media and through other public means. So you, you've got that type of general prohibition, but there are huge safe harbors that almost swallow the rule. For example, attorneys can always talk about the claims, offenses, and defenses in the case. They can always talk about the content of a public record. And they can always rebut negative, adverse, prejudicial publicity when they or their client were not the ones to generate it. They only have to, the only limitation is that the rebuttal has to be limited uh, as to what is necessary to undo the negative publicity. So basically you have to respond to the exact types of claims or issues that the other side has raised in the public. But again, those, those safe harbors, and that's a fraction of the safe harbors in the rule, rule 3-6, the fraction of safe harbors, they're potent and they give attorneys wide leverage and, and wide discretion to talk publicly about cases. When it comes to ongoing cases, as you get closer to trial and you're actually during trial, what you say to, a, to the public is going to be under a more close microscope by the judge and is going to be looked at as potentially more likely to interfere 
with the to, to substantially materially prejudice the trial than if those comments were said three months prior or six months prior. So what you want to do when you're talking publicly about cases, you could certainly, even during a trial, comment on the judge's ruling, comment on the claims or offenses or defenses in the case, but you, you need to stay away from the types of issues and, and the substance of issues that, uh, that jurors will be considering. So for example, and this is in the rule too, uh, as a comment to the rule, attorneys want to stay away from talking about the kind of evidence that'll be admitted. They want to stay away from the credibility of witnesses or parties in the case. They want to stay away from test results or examinations. They want to stay away from evidence that they know with a reasonable likelihood is not going to be inadmissible. So if you think about it in your mind, you could see how when a judge rules on a particular matter, you could say, you know, we're, we're pleased that the judge ruled, as we've said all along, X, Y, Z, and we're happy the judge agrees, or vice versa. Um, but you, you don't want to get into attacking, certainly the judge, that's going to be a problem. You don't want to be attacking the people as not credible or as, you know, scumbags. You don't want to be attacking evidence as crappy or strong and persuasive. If it's a content of a public record, so if something is discussed during an open trial date where, where the court's open and people are reporting on it, that's fine. But as you're in the middle of a trial, that's really when you get to be, where you need to be on your, your game in terms of ethically, because that is where there's more of a chance for you as an attorney to say something that could be unethical. And there are many court rules. So aside from the ethical rules, there are many court rules federal court rules that um, mirror the language of rule 3.6. So from an ethical perspective, you've got rule 3.6, but from like a sanctions perspective, you have many local rules in in the federal court system. So you could have a judge who says, I'm not going to wait for the disciplinary board of your state to rule on this clearly unethical statement. I'm going to sanction you by doing X, Y, or Z. Wayne, the question I have is, so let's say you've got a criminal case the defendant that's hired a criminal defense attorney and so they've they've already spent that money and then the attorney says listen we need to bring in wayne pollock because wayne is going to win this case in the court of public opinion right is there hesitation usually from that defendant from that client saying listen i've already paid an attorney why do i need to pay this wayne pollock guy i mean and if so what's your what's your response to that it may surprise you to learn that the clients are generally an easier sell than the attorneys. The attorneys want to, first of all, the attorneys feel like they are being imposed upon sometimes. They feel like the work that I'm doing is somehow overlapping with their work. They might feel like they can handle it. They're the attorney after all. Like they're hired to do all of these things, including talking to the press. They should be the ones to do it. I get some pushback from from attorneys more often than I do uh, on clients. From a business perspective, I try to structure my fees in a way that is not going to feel redundant when a client says, oh, geez, yeah, I'm paying my primary attorney, then I need your specialized assistance. It's going to cost me double. It's not going to cost them double. I try and and work with the primary attorney and the client to structure something that, that makes sense and that's mutually beneficial for all parties. But there are some attorney, for every attorney I meet that is understanding of the need to outsource this type of expertise because they don't have it and it's time consuming, I do occasionally run into another attorney who says, well, that's what I do. Like I talk to the press when they call and I usually say, well, that's the difference is I'm the one who helps generate those press calls. You simply sit back and, and wait until someone calls you and sometimes you can't wait. There was an interesting case recently. I I live in Philadelphia, work in Philadelphia. The Philadelphia district attorney was indicted for basically bribery and was later pled guilty. There was an onslaught of bad publicity about his case. Why? Well, the federal prosecutors released a press release. They held a press conference. They were able to get the court of public opinion buzzing about these about allegations of wrongdoing. And the defense attorneys, just, they didn't know how to, they clearly didn't know how to respond. It got to the point where the, it was clear from some reporting in major newspapers that the federal government was leaking information that was not in the indictment to the press. 
Now, most attorneys don't even know how to look for that. They just, they just gloss over that. But that, to me, would have been the entire basis for your response, which is to say, hey, look, not only are they trying to convince, convict our client in the court of law, they're trying to get a head start in the court of public opinion, and they're shameless. They are leaking documents to the press. And when I give that example, that's when the attorneys who sometimes push back say, wait, what do you mean they were leaking information? What, what do you mean? And they understand that it's specialized expertise. And it's not just you being an attorney naturally knowing how to do this. You have to have some background with the media, with persuasion. And really, when we look at the, the most prominent lawyers in the media, there's two reasons why they're there. One, they're, uh, they're generally there because they answer the phone when reporters call. When a reporter says, look, uh, we saw this case was filed. Do you want to comment on it? They typically say, oh, hell yeah, I want to comment on it. So they pick up the phone. And two, they're not afraid to call a reporter when they file a case and don't want to wait. You know, if, if they're involved in a huge personal injury case or a huge discrimination case, they're not afraid to pick up the phone. So the, the, the willingness to engage a court, of a, a court of public opinion has this nice, stealthy marketing benefit too, which is your stature and your prominence is bound to increase in your practice area and in your geography because people are reading articles about you. It's, it's a cousin of the newsjacking, but here it's not just you commenting on an article, uh, not you commenting on a legal dispute that you know about. You're involved in the case and, and unlike a court of law where guess what? No one's reading your court filings. No, very few prospective clients are reading your court filings. Here, when you've got an article in your local daily paper or on an online media, where people are wa basically watching you in action and watching your persuasion in action, that's, that's golden marketing for you that both could lead to a client then and there and also could be repurposed for your blog, for your social media feed, and your email newsletter. Wayne, explain to us how the process would work in working with you. And let's, let's not talk about so much like a very, very high profile case, but sort of a bread and butter case that some of our listeners would probably come across. I mean, I think it's easy to get publicity if you're defending Michael Flynn, who's in the process of <laughs> pleading guilty right now to lying to the FBI. But so what, in, a, in an everyday kind of a case, how, how would you work with us? How would you advise us? How would the relationship go? So the goal of my work is to help attorneys and those clients fairly resolve the client's cases. So the legal strategy always comes first. And unlike a PR person where sometimes it's all about just getting publicity, this is very much targeted. We want to impact the case ethically and strategically, and we want to resolve the case as favorably as possible while also helping to minimize any reputational harm. So the way we work with other lawyers is we get a feel, we work with the attorneys to get a feel for developments in their cases. Developments could be filings of complaints, filings of dispositive motions, discovery, or even trial. And we work with them to figure out what aspect of this case development, if any, is relevant to the media. And if so, who will we be talking to in the media or publicly about this case to generate increased interest and awareness? In a way, it's, it's issue spotting, but a different kind of issue spotting. So unlike writing a complaint where you are issue spotting the relevant facts and the legal claims that you think make sense and packaging them together, in the form of this narrative document, what I'm doing is looking at the substance of the complaint, the facts, or, or the substance of the legal dispute, the facts, the area of law that's being discussed and, and being applied, plus what's going on in, in society, what's going on locally, regionally, nationally, in particular industries, and who would be interested in talking to us about that. So for a discrimination case, you know, there are, we're in arguably peak sexual harassment awareness era. So you better believe that any sexual harassment case that's filed is going to get a little more spotlight than normal because that is what is on the tip of the tongue of most people right now in 2017, December 2017, when this podcast is being recorded. So we would help other attorneys isolate which reporters would be of interest to us, which publications would be of interest to us, which third parties would be of interest to us. So for example, you know, just like there are amicus briefs at the appellate level, 
and, and really any level, I guess, when it comes to filing uh, briefs, you could also view third-party advocacy groups as almost like amici or amici for the court of public opinion. So let's say you've got a small, you know, problematic type of technology issue where you think your client is being wrongly sued by the government or by a third party for violating some law that, that is unconstitutional. Well, what about reaching out to the ACLU or the Electronic Frontier Foundation? The third parties who have their own publicity and court of public opinion engagement cycles that can help you. So we, we look to those third parties as well. We work with uh, the lawyers. We generally handle the media outreach. So we'll draft the pitch to the reporters, normally over email. We'll also draft messaging. So when a reporter calls and says, I don't have time for an interview, do you have a statement you could send me? We have something in the can, normally 100, 200 words, that will hopefully be persuasive, strategic, non-defamatory, and help to make the client's case in this particular article that is more persuasive than you as an attorney being called while you're in the middle of something and the reporter wanting to talk to you and you say, oh gee, I, I'll just get back to you and you forget and you lose the opportunity. So we, we work with attorneys to look at developments in cases, determine if they are newsworthy or could be of interest to other third parties. We then handle that outreach to the third parties, including the media. We help to conduct the interviews. Sometimes I do on background interviews with reporters to give them a sense of, of what the legal issues are here. On background means that we won't be quoted directly, that they could use the information to do their own reporting, but they're not going to comment and say, Wayne Pollack says the essence of a sexual harassment claim, uh, claim is this. It's more for their background to learn about a, a, an issue or a legal dispute. A lot of it is the issue spotting. A lot of it is saying, you know, you've got this, this gold mine right here of interesting cases. You need to get out there with it. I would, I'm, I'm willing to bet that, that you, Jim, you, Tyson, and many of the listeners to this episode have cases in their firm that could be of interest to the press and could be of interest to the court of public opinion, but they just don't realize it. And in some instances, that is a missed opportunity for marketing. But in the vast majority of instances, I think that's a missed opportunity to make your client's case in the court of public opinion and get a better result. We know how this works because we're lawyers. We know that there are times where when another side is threatened with ongoing litigation and the possibility of certain things becoming public, they do not want to go any further with the, the case. They know that discovery will be pro a problem. They know that if there's news articles about the dispute and them being alleged to have done wrong things, it's going to be a problem for them and they resolve the case quickly. Great example of this, guys, would be in uh, early 2017, I think March, United Airlines had a problem when they dragged a passenger, David Dow, off of an airline. You may recall that video went viral. He was wearing glasses. His nose was bloodied. His glasses were broken. It was a big deal. That case settled real quick. Like all his attorney, all of Mr. Dow's attorneys did was file some type of claim in Illinois State Court concerning discovery, some procedural issue. They didn't even file a complaint. The case was settled before a complaint. Why? Because every news article about that complaint would have had a link to that viral social media video of him being dragged. And what do you think that was worth to United to resolve that case and get it over with as soon as possible, to, to get it off the pages of the newspaper, off of your news feed online, uh, on social media, and get them back to focusing on trying to be a good company and, and the perception of a good company. To your point, not every um, attorney is going to have these types of high profile cases, but for the vast majority of cases, particularly litigation, you are going to find instances where reaching out to the court of public opinion is something that would be helpful to the case and to the client. I'm just curious, what are some of the self-help tools that, that attorneys could use if they can't afford to hire you? For example, like what are your thoughts on, on using press releases and things like that? I think press releases are more helpful from a marketing perspective than they are for getting publicity. I would say that you could always put up a press release, spend a couple hundred bucks, put it on a, a press release news, excuse me, a press release distribution wire like Business Wire, PR News Wire, PR Web, and kind of just see what happens. I mean, that, that, that could work for, for some attorneys. But 
many reporters are almost spammed by legions of PR people who are sending them press releases. To be able to email a reporter and in the, and in the, law, uh, the subject line simply say lawsuit colon, you know, sexual harassment claims filed against XYZ company, that is going to get a little bit more attention because right now, and, and I think for the foreseeable future, a legal issue, a, a lawsuit seems to be more serious than you as a, as a, as a business person announcing that your new company is, is opening up a new office or even your law firm is opening up a new office. You know, the tension and conflict at issue in a legal dispute usually makes for interesting reading. So press releases, I think, are good for the a website as you build your marketing and you build your credibility to say, we did this case, we filed this case, we received this verdict. Again, be careful when you're writing a press release. Make sure you are quoting the, alleg the, the complaint and always saying the allegations are, the complaint says. Make sure that you are avoiding defamation concerns when possible. In terms of self-help, you know, I could give some really easy homework that I think would be helpful to anybody listening to the podcast. Keep an eye out for the next time you read an article about a legal dispute or litigation. Keep your eyes open and, and read as an active reader, same way you would read an opposing counsel's letter or settlement demand or, or court filing. Look at what the article is really about. Did you notice what the legal development was? Was it a complaint? Was it discovery? Was it a trial? Whose perspective did this case, excuse me, the news article come from? Was it the plaintiff? Was it the defendant? Who was quoted? Were the court filings quoted? Were the defendants, were the parties quoted? Were the attorneys quoted? Did anybody decline to comment? Either the plaintiff's attorney or the defense attorney or, or maybe even the parties. And then once you actu actually look, looked at that and thought about this, what did you think about those parties after reading the, the article? Did you think that one party has a better case than the other? Why did you think that? Uh, did one side come across more favorably? Did you, as a lawyer, have a gut reaction to say, wow, these defendants really screwed up, even though you know there are two sides to a story and the plaintiff often gets to frame the legal dispute in the manner that they choose based on them getting to the courthouse first. And as you unpack that when you read these types of articles, you might be able to, to better pitch reporters and reach out to reporters because then you, you know how the sausage is made a bit. You know what the end result looks like, and you can make sure that you're commenting or providing necessary materials to give the reporter what he or she needs to write a coherent story that is hopefully persuasively um, favoring your client. So the, the press release angle, the analytical reading angle is another, another way of, of self-helping. And I think from a client service perspective, you know, get a sense from your clients. Do they want you to tell their story? Do they feel like they've been wronged in a way that desires or demands greater public awareness of a, of a case? You know, your clients could be the beneficiaries of additional non-legal help through publicity and through awareness where you have people stepping out of the woodwork and saying, you know what? I read about this hugely unfair landlord tenant dispute. I can't believe that your client has two or three kids and they have to live like this based on the landlord. Here's a $10,000 donation for them to stay at a hotel, or here is some other gesture of goodwill that could help your client. Look at what your client is going through and determine, is this something that if more people knew about it, they might uh, flock to their aid? And if so, is there a human interest side to this? I'm willing to bet that a reporter is going to be interested in, in covering the story. All right. So for my last question, I want to take it a little bit in a different direction, Wayne. And my thought is this, that right now immigration with Donald Trump in the White House is a very hot topic. And I'd like to raise my profile nationally and to start commenting in national publications or on the television. And I'm wondering what suggestions you might have for me in a situation like that. I would suggest that you look at all of the people who have covered the immigration bans or other aspects of, of, of immigration regionally and nationally. Look at those articles and you will assemble basically a media list of reporters that have covered this before and who are likely to cover it down the road. And I would draft a 
mm, two to three paragraph email, have a catchy subject line about you know, potential expert resource for uh, immigration law, and in your paragraph or two or three, explain who you are, why you are someone that could comment on the immigration issues that this reporter is covering, and perhaps even include as a third paragraph your view on what's next or what you expect to happen next. And blast that email out when you know there's something coming up where there'll be immigration stories out there based on developments nationally or locally. And if you even wanted to get really technical, you could create some type of email marketing newsletter that's simply for reporters and explain that you're sending this not necessarily because you expect press coverage of the letter, but you are want to introduce yourself as someone who is an expert on this topic. And with that repetition, you will hopefully be able to get some, some press. And like all marketing and, and public relations, it is a snowball rolling downhill, not a boulder being rolled uphill. You start with a small local publication, a weekly publication, a local online publication. And once you get a couple of those, now you can, you'll, you'll snowball that into maybe the local daily newspaper or a regional publication, and then maybe it's a national law publication, and then maybe it's a national daily newspaper. You, you snowball, but you have to start small because people want to be able to know that you have actually been quoted as an expert before. People are, especially reporters, are hesitant to take a chance on someone who they don't know, or when they Google you or look at your bio, you don't have any articles or any media engagements listed. But to your point, I think getting your name out there could be a benefit to uh, you once you introduce yourself to the right people. And in this instance, to be immigration reporters or reporters who have covered that topic. A lot of great information, Wayne. We, we really appreciate it. We are up against the time. So before we get to our tips and our hack of the week, I do want to first thank William Eady for introducing us to you. Uh, this is a great guest for our listeners. Uh, I also want to remind Thanks, everyone to, to, to go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and give us a five-star review. It really does make a difference. We want to make sure that we get all this information, this great content out to, uh, to everyone. So make sure you share us and give us five-star reviews. Jimmy, do you have a hack of the week? Yeah, I do. But before I do, I just wanted to ask, Wayne, how do we get a hold of you? How do our listeners find you? My website is Copo Strategies. That's, it's C-O-P-O, copostrategies.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter as Wayne Pollock, full one word, Wayne Pollock underscore CS. I am on Facebook, WaynePollock.cs. I have a blog, Copocetic, C-O-P-O-C-E-T-I-C, kind of like Copacetic, but from a branding perspective, I thought Copocetic was pretty cool. Copocetic.com is our blog, but through Copo Strategies, you'll be able to reach me through email, social media, and, and phone. My hack of the week is I've gone back to inbox. So, you know, I'm a big Gmail user and, and I was living in Gmail and I always would click on my emails as Mark is unread. So I'd have this little stack of unread, allegedly unread emails, but really emails I just needed to do something with. And I've, I've switched back to inbox.google.com for my email. And once you get the hang of it about pinning emails and you can send them out for to remind you later to look at them the next morning, the next evening. It's really gotten me much more engaged with the email and moving things out a lot faster and in a sort of organized fashion. Nice. Well, you're the second attorney this week that's uh, reintroduced me to, to Inbox, so maybe I'll, I'll try it out and see how, how I like it. All right, Wayne, so you've listened to podcasts. You know how it is. You got a tip of the week for us? I do. My tip is that you are your brand and your brand is you. You always need to be cognizant of what you're doing from a business perspective, a marketing perspective, a substantive perspective of your brand and match your brand with who you are and the services you provide. A quick example, for me, all you need to know about branding is Jimmy Buffett and Margaritaville. When you think Margaritaville, when you think Jimmy Buffett and you look at him and look at his songs, what do they connote? What do they bring to your mind? They, they bring this peaceful beach paradise of no worries, no concerns, and like fun and, and enjoyment. You want your clients, you want the media, you want opposing counsel, you want uh, referring attorneys to have one consistent view of you and what you're trying to build. And that should be displayed through the people who pick up the phone at your firm, your emails, your social media posts and even your, your interpersonal communications and just the way you handle yourself when you're at 
social functions, professional functions, you name it. Very good advice. All right, so my tip is actually inspired by William Meady. We had William Eady on about a month ago, and he was talking about SEO and how the internet is weak, and he is so right. So, because we've launched a couple new websites, I've, I've been editing my old website, and I've seen a, a, just a gigantic increase in my numbers doing simple things. But this, this tip is to go to a service like Moz, that's M-O-Z, or one I've been using recently is the Hoth, T-H-E-H-O-T-H, and, and just plug your website in and see where you are ranking for certain keywords and find the high volume keywords. So here's the tip. Find the high volume keywords that are coming through and the ones that you're sort of lacking on and attack those keywords. So edit whatever blog post you have or page on your website that's, that's driving that traffic. Um, add some content to it and you'll see your numbers increase by three, four, five pages. It's really incredible. So go do that. It's going to make a huge difference. We're getting traffic now. And we have a brand new website. It's, it's only a couple months old. And we're already seeing traffic come through the website for personal injury in St. Louis, which is a very, very competitive market. So Willie Meadie's right. The internet is weak. So go out and attack your website. Thanks for listening to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. The Maximum Lawyer Podcast. To stay in contact with your host and to access more content, more content. go to MaximumLawyer.com. Maximum Have a great week and catch you next time.